happy Black History Month, family. I am Maurice Hobson, Associate Professor of Africana Studies and Historian at Georgia State University. On today, we will be having a conversation around caste and how it plays out in Atlanta. History is a weapon studied and interpreted wisely. It can help defend, inspire, protect, and unify. If history is ignored, forgotten, or misconstrued, it can be a part of the miseducation of a people that will have them going to the back door without being told to do so. That is a reference to Carter G. Woodson's comments in his timeless classic, The Miseducation of the Negro. Of all of our studies, history is so very important, not only because it is a vital means to the cognition of and to the solution to many of the problems that beset us, but because it is at the heart and soul of liberation itself. A major aspect in my development as a scholar activist in history is steeped in public history, avenues in which history can be of service and listens to the precise needs of black communities and challenges these communities to broaden their own senses of boundaries and exclusiveness. Perhaps public history and service it's more of a spirit that sees historical scholarship as part of a larger scope that includes academic and non-academic entities, as well as various components of the public at large. My interest as a scholar, activist, and servant is guided by a commitment to the preservation and dissemination of Black heritage, history, and culture, in particular, and the African diasporic heritages and histories in general. As a servant to history, I strive to construct a context where the public has the opportunity to produce critical knowledges that consequently enable them to become critical citizens. I organize my service so that it provides the public with the opportunity to challenge, explore, and construct relationships between personal experiences, community experiences, and public policy. In this, the world is our classroom and the classroom is our world. I am always grateful and honored to be in what I consider to be my academic and intellectual oasis here in Atlanta, Georgia, the Auburn Avenue Research Library. As long as I have breath in my lungs, I will always sing the praises of this particular institution because so much of the preservation of African-American history is front and center here at the Auburn Avenue Research Library. So if you're ever in Atlanta, or if you live in Atlanta, check out their programming. Come, come check out some of the things that they have to offer, particularly in the archives. In the Annals of American Race Relations, the case of Atlanta, Georgia offers a complicated narrative of Black life and history through the lens of caste and class. For more than a century, the city has been inextricably linked to the highest achievements of Black folk in the areas of education, business, and politics. Atlanta's long-standing tradition of Black education emerged during Reconstruction and produced a Black elite and middle class that prospered not with, notwithstanding Jim Crow and rose to leadership after the 1960s. Much of Atlanta's imagery as a mecca for Black people is attributed to influences of self-help of Black respectability movements. The emergence of these movements, though necessary, have further complicated Black life in Atlanta. This presentation focuses on these tensions. In the larger discussion of the Talented Ten, a social movement detailing Black respectability and representation emerged amongst America's Black elite and middle classes. This movement grounded itself in racial uplift as self-help as service to the black masses. In this, the black elite and middle classes attempted to distinguish themselves from the black masses as agents of civilization by cultivating positive representations of black life to assuage pathological misperceptions birthed by white America after reconstruction. The hostile recapture of the American South by Southern redeemers fortified by a series of laws that crippled black people for decades and inaugurated a period known as the Nadir, the lowest point for African descended people in this country. A central assumption of racial uplift 
was that black material and moral progress would diminish white racism. However, the shortcoming was that the emphasis of class distinction and patriarchal authority, as racial uplift theory was, is inextricably linked to the same pejorative notions of racial pathology that whites held against blacks. Through this framework, scholars and deemed leaders squared off publicly to debate self-help and racial uplift. In Du Bois's model of self-help and racial uplift, presuppose that college education was a prerequisite for respectability and membership. Specifically, he promoted liberal arts and professional education that he believed trained a broadly defined Black intelligentsia. Moreover, he held fast to the idea that liberal arts education was necessary for building autonomous Black communities as it disciplined and furnished the mind, developed character, and enriched life by fostering learning as conditions in America changed. Du Bois coined the concept of the talented tent, a byproduct of racial uplift and self-help to describe this particular aspect of the elite. While Isabel Wilkerson's cast, The Origins of Our Discontent focuses on the infrastructure of America's class divisions and rankings. This presentation seeks to demonstrate the complex nature of caste and class within Black communities in general and Atlanta's Black communities in particular. It is reckless to ever fully discount race and racism in the American experience. The stratification and classification of caste and class amongst Black communities remains cryptic to the untrained eye. However, this presentation will put Wilkerson's text in conversation with the Black lived experiences in our city, providing for useful place-based research while portraying a striking divide between the Black elite and poor city dwellers, complicating the long-held view of Atlanta as a mecca for Black people. Now, as you can see on the screen, I have titled this presentation, Outing Cast, How Atlanta Fares with Isabel Wilkerson's Text. As you see on the left, you see Isabel Wilkerson's book cast. And on the right, you see the legend of the black mecca of politics and class um, in the making of modern Atlanta written by myself. So the question that we must ask is what is class? And how we articulate that is based on these particular ideas as defined by the dictionary. It is that each of the hereditary classes distinguished by relative degrees of ritual purity or pollution and of social status. It can also embody a system of dividing society into hereditary classes. And lastly, but not least, it's any class or group of people who inherit exclusive privileges or are perceived as socially distinct. But oftentimes, particularly when you steep it in American racism and the Jim Crow South, it may play out differently. And I guess where I'm coming from on this is that even though you may have the black elite, the black middle classes, the black working class, you got the black poor, you got the, um, the unsanctioned communities that kind of live underground, all of these particular groups of folks in the American South through American history, through the lens of American history and American race relations, have all had to engage and interact with each other. Before we really get into this, I wanna kind of give a brief kind of uh, timeline aspect of Atlanta, Georgia. Of course, Atlanta was founded as Terminus in 1837, and then the name changed to Atlanta, a shortened version of Atlantica Pacifica because of the railroads. What we now call Atlanta, was a hub to where trains could go to the Northeast, to the Midwest, to the West Coast, or to South Florida. And so Atlanta becomes a very viable hub in, in terms of transportation and trade. In 1864, Atlanta was, was captured by General William Tecumseh Sherman during his march to the sea. At this time, Atlanta was not the crown jewel of the American South that it would later become. But between 1865 and 1886, you have the founding of several historically Black colleges and universities in the city. 
Atlanta University is founded in 1865. Morehouse College is founded in Augusta as Augusta Bible College, moves to Atlanta as Atlanta Bible College, and then later becomes Morehouse College. It's founded in 1867. Clark, Clark University is founded in 1869. Morris Brown College's Spelman College were founded in 1881. And the Gammon Theological Seminary is founded in what is believed 1886. However, in 1886, a man by the name of Henry Grady, who was a manage, managing editor of the Atlanta Journal-Constitution, promoted the idea of the New South, a more industrial style of governing and politics versus the agrarian uh, style of politics that had governed the land in previous generations. And what happens with this is while the New South created new opportunities uh, for a booming white nouveau riche, it did very little to help black folk. In 1895, the city of Atlanta became the site for the Cotton States and International Exhibition, where Tuskegee Institute Principal Booker T. Washington gave his speech that provided the legal, legal language for codification and segregation. It lays out the foundation for uh, separate but equal. In 1906, the city was marred by the Atlanta Race Massacre which was one of the most violent race massacres to take place in the history of the United States. What this did though, is it codified segregation into a particular kind of law. And so now segregation was not only de jure, but it was also de facto. In 1924, black folk caucus together and using their political might founded Booker T. Washington High School, which opened as the first black public high school in the city. In 1928, the Atlanta Daily World newspaper was founded, which became the only daily newspaper in the United States at that time. 1946, you had the establishment of the Atlanta Negro Voters League, which was established by John Wesley Dobbs and A.T. Walden. And what the Atlanta Negro Voters League did is it established real voting power for black folk. Much of the Atlanta Negro Voters League grew out of the Supreme Court case King v. Chapman that outlawed the all white primary in the state of Georgia. And when the all white primary was outlawed, what then happens is black folk across the state becoming very much a sizable voting block. And of course, that is even more distilled in Atlanta. In 1948, Atlanta hired its first black police officers. 1956, the city was deemed as the city too busy to hate by William Hartsfield. And of course, this is juxtaposed with Montgomery and uh, Topeka, Kansas, where we see the Montgomery bus boycott that takes place in, in 19. Uh, 55. We see Brown v. Board of Education in 1954. We also see several incidents that are, are on the horizon, such as the desegregation of Central High School in Little Rock, Arkansas. In 1960, the Atlanta Inquirer, an alternative Black newspaper, was founded that dealt with more radical ideas. In 1961, Atlanta's public school system desegregates, and it becomes the first major Southern city to do so. During the same time, Atlanta's public transportation desegregates as well. In 1965, QB Williamson was elected to the Alderman Board. So that's a citywide election that shows Atlanta's prowess in terms of black political empowerment and electoral politics. In 1966, you have the Summer Hill Rebellion that takes place in the Summer Hill community. In 1967, you have the Dixie Hill Rebellion that takes place in the Dixie Hill community. And in 1968, you have the assassination of Atlanta's most beloved son, the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Whereas Atlanta is the only major black city in the United States that does not rebel. Oftentimes the city's boosters will present that, it didn't, uh, that, that Atlanta did not rebel or erupt because of its um, progressive white leadership. But the truth of the matter is that the reason that the city did not erupt was because black Atlanta respected their most beloved son, and they understood his notion of nonviolent direct action. They understood that that would not help the cause of what it meant to be Black in Atlanta. To juxtapose um, the work that has been done by Isabel Wilkerson in her book, Cast, my own book, The Legend of the Black Method, Politics and Class, and the Making of Modern Atlanta, is a critical response to current trends and tensions in the scholarly literature in the new African-American urban history. Until most recently, most historians had focused on the city's black upper and middle classes and their role in creating the black method image and 
pushing Atlanta towards world-class status through their relationship with the city's white elite. This particular book was steeped in archival records, interviews, analysis of popular cultural sources, and qualitative textual analyses supported by quantitative methods such as mapping and demography. Much of what you will know about this book was found right here in the Auburn Avenue Research Library. As I stated earlier, Atlanta was founded in 1837 as Terminus. It then changed its name to Atlanta, uh, shortened for Atlanta Pacifica, uh, the Atlanta Pacifica Railroad. And according to the US Census, the population in 1847 was 2,569 uh, citizens, 2,058 were white, 511 black. Uh, many of them were probably enslaved. But even before emancipation, even before the, the Civil War and emancipation, you had historical figures such as Roderick Bad Badger, who was a free black dentist, who was the most sought after dentist in the city in 1859. You also have Alonzo Herndon, who was a free black entrepreneur who was born in 1858 uh, in Social Circle, Georgia, moves to Atlanta in 1876, and he starts Atlanta Life Insurance Company in 1905. Here are some images of uh, Dr. Roderick Badger and Alonzo Herndon. However, we have to talk about Mr. Booker T. Washington, who was the principal of Tuskegee Institute. Booker T. Washington um, was considered to be the most prominent uh, black man. He was powerful with powerful friends. He was born into slavery in Western Virginia, what is now West Virginia. Uh, received an education at Hampton Institute, which was originally founded for indigenous people. Uh, he was taken uh, and he was mentored by Samuel Chapman Armstrong, who believed in universal education for black folk. And because they had such a tight bond, Booker T. Washington was sent down to Tuskegee, Alabama to create the Tuskegee Institute, which is based on the Hamptonian model. What's significant about Mr. Washington is that in 1895 at the Cotton States International Exhibition, Booker T. Washington gives a speech that would later be deemed as the Atlanta Compromise by W.E.B. Du Bois. And I want to complicate this particular kind of uh, analysis. In Booker T. Washington's speech, he made, this, he made the statement that in all things um, economic and social, we could be as equal, but in all things political, we could be separate. And what happens is with the deliberations going on with the US Supreme Court through the Plessy versus Ferguson court case, what happens with this is Booker T. Washington's words are used to codify the context of separate but equal, which is a result of the Plessy versus Ferguson court case. And what separate but equal does is it codifies segregation into law, it creates Jim Crow. And what it does is it makes an insider outsider um, relationship between blacks and whites in the United States. Technically what this does is it makes public property white private property. W.E.B. Du Bois was born in Great Barrington, Massachusetts in 1868. He was Northern. Uh, he was really unfamiliar with uh, the folk ways of Black folk in the American South, who by and large at the time of his birth were coming out of slavery and were newly emancipated. And so this is at the time when, when, when Black folk were striving. The thing about it is W.E.B. Du Bois eventually comes South. He is educated at Fisk University in Nashville, Tennessee. He later studies at the University of Berlin in Berlin, Germany. And he becomes the first black person to receive a PhD uh, from Harvard University. He receives his PhD in history, but he also becomes the father of sociology, which marries aspects of the past with the present and how things will be seen in the future. From 1897 to 1910, Du Bois lived here in Atlanta, Georgia, where he taught at Atlanta University. He founded a, a clinic that would look at the life and conditions of Black folk. And while here, he saw Atlanta as a striving city. This is what Du Bois wrote about Atlanta. Such are not men of the sturdier make. They have Atlanta turned resolutely toward the future. And that future held aloft vistas of purple and gold. Atlanta, queen of the cotton kingdom. Atlanta, gateway to the land of the sun. Atlanta, the new legacies, meaning the measurement of uh, success, the measurement of progress. 
So the city crowned her hundred hills with factories and stored her shops with cunning handiwork and stretched long iron ways to greet the busy Mercury in his coming. And the nation talked of her strivings. Here Du Bois posits this idea that Atlanta is a particular kind of place. It's a hustling, bustling city. And it is a place where for an opportunity a black folk to come and assert themselves. It had all of the accoutrements. It had education. It had economics. It had aspirations for politics. It, it embodied culture. Atlanta was this unique place. But then what Du Bois does is he pivots and he compares Atlanta to the Greek goddess Adelante. Adelante was a goddess who was fleet of foot and she was beautiful. She would only marry a man that could beat her in a foot race. Many men would come from throughout the countryside to engage her because they wanted to marry her. When she would beat them, they would be put to death. So there's this one suitor by the name of Hippomenes. And Hippomenes really wants to marry Adelante. And he goes to an old scribe and he says, what can I do to marry her? And he says, well, why don't you lay three golden apples along the course of the race? This will distract her and you can marry her. And so what Du Bois writes in this, and I would imagine, I'm using my historical imagination here, is that um, Adelante and Hippomenes uh, go to the starting line. Somebody said, get on your mark, get set, go. And this is what Du Bois writes. She fled like a shadow, paused, started over the first apple. But even as he stretched his hand, fled again, hovered over the second, then slipping from his high grasp, flew over the river, vale, and hill. But as she lingered over the third, his arms fell around her. And looking on each other, the blazing passion of their love profaned the sanctuary of love, and they were cursed. And then Du Bois writes this, if Atlanta be not named for Adelante, she ought to have been. And what Du Bois is saying is that Atlanta's future will be one to where it would have to balance out the idea of greed and mammon versus morality. As we consider how caste and class works, we must consider John Wesley Dobbs, and Austin T. Walden. John Wesley Dobbs was considered to be the unofficial mayor of the Sweet Auburn District and was the highest ranking black mason in all of Georgia. He was a mail carrier. He was also a trustee at Morehouse College, an institution that he attended for two years. He was married and had six daughters, um, but because he was such a high ranking mason, the highest ranking mason in all of Georgia, he had particular influence and he would walk the streets of the Sweet Auburn district and he would hand out money. One of the things that John Wesley Dobbs was known for was he could interact with white pastors and they would meet up in secret places to talk about race relations. Also, I'd like for you all to consider Austin T. Walden, who was the first assistant district attorney for Fulton County in Georgia. Um, this was a very high profile position for a black man. Um, basically, Austin T. Walden was able to become a part of the system. Between John Wesley Dobbs and Austin T. Walden, they created the Atlanta Negro Voters League. And the Atlanta Negro Voters League was founded as a result of the King v. Chapman court case. What the Atlanta Negro Voters League was, was it was a group of 36 of the most prominent black men who would engage the white community and they were able to negotiate deals for the black community. While this had a particular moment and a particular interest, part of the problem that comes out of this are, is that the fact that these elite black men would negotiate deals on behalf of the black masses, but they wouldn't always go and talk to the black masses to see what the black masses need. This is how we can understand how caste plays into all of this conversation in Atlanta. One of John Wesley Dobbs' mentees was the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Dr. King had grown up with John Wesley Dobbs' youngest daughters, Maddie Wilda Dobbs and June Dobbs Butts, uh, who would eventually become June Dobbs Butts. June and Dr. King were both classmates at Booker T. Washington High School. And so the thing about Martin Luther King's ideas around nonviolent direct action around the beloved community, much of that was fostered by the work that John Wesley Dobbs had put forth. So you could already see how this particular group of men with resources were in particular ways able 
to move forward, to engage, and to put Atlanta on a national and international scene in terms of race relations. In February of 1968, several weeks before Dr. King was assassinated, President Lyndon B. Johnson commissioned the, uh, a report that is officially called the National Advisory Commission on Civil Disorders. This report is constantly known in the public as the Kerner Report because it was chaired by then Illinois Governor Otto Kerner. And what this report lays out is that the reason that black communities were in such disarray, the reason that black communities were rebelling against the system, uh, the reason that black communities were, were, were really upset was because of slavery and also because of the fact that the system, the, the American system based on capitalism had really divided this nation. And what it suggested is that there were two Americas, one white, one black, and both of them were going in different directions. In 1968, a group of journalists applied the Colonel Report to Atlanta with a series that was titled The Two Atlantas, an in-depth painstaking examination of the racial picture today in Atlanta. And what this particular series does is it really does fully demonstrate serious conversations around economic opportunities in Atlanta. In terms of the Kerner Report and how it plays out in Atlanta, one of the areas that it tackled were black ghettos and public housing. According to Economic Opportunity Atlanta, it estimated that the average black family had five to six children and lived in a fewer than a five room house existing on an inadequate diet. So that speaks to a lack of, uh, of good home, housing and food insecurities, food deserts. Most of the homes were headed by women, though this is not problematic. What it suggests is that one of the ways in which a family becomes eligible for public housing is that it had to be a single parent. And oftentimes um, women were head, uh, heads of households. Approximately 32,000 lived in Atlanta's 16 public housing where there were four built for whites. So by and large, 12 were built for black folk. So you, 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 you begin to see what's going on. here. Now, we're not even talking about the black elite and middle classes. We're talking about the black masses. 75% of Atlanta's public housing was black. You had 18,000 children who inhabited these spaces. Yet 45% of households that were headed by women this is in 1963, 63% by 1967. Now, mind you, between 1963 and 1967, you have the passage of the Civil Rights Act of 1964, which buttressed the 14th Amendment and grants you equal protection and due process under the law, and the Voting Rights Act of 1965, which buttressed the 15th Amendment and voting. So while we had civil rights legislation, things moved from where 45% of households were headed by women in 1963, where it then jumps to 63% in 1967. It is suggested that the culture of poverty was one of the main culprits in Atlanta, and this is reflected in, uh, in terms of patterns seen from chattel slavery. What the culture of poverty is, is it's this notion that the poor carry a particular burden of what it means to be poor. While the notion of the culture of poverty is problematic, it does have some insight on understanding class formation and, and, and stratification. And when you go into black communities, it gives us a very unique perspective. Another aspect that was tackled in the Kerner Report was public safety, also known as the man, where the police reminded Atlanta's black masses of mental and physical scars because there was too much force and too little protection. You had where poor black Atlantans hoped for white officers to show up when there was an issue because black officers oftentimes worked too hard to prove themselves as being different than the black masses being policed. This goes back to the theoretical framework that I pushed forth before, the notion of racial uplift. Poverty was the cause of crime. And I guess what I'm saying is that I'm, we are not indicting poor people here. 
But what we're saying is if you have limited education, limited resources, um, and limited opportunities for jobs, then it will push you into petty crimes. What we also see here is it presents class tensions within the black community. These are intraracial class tensions. In terms of politics and class, you had Julian Bond who stated that politics is one way. Politics will pave streets, provide some jobs and make sure some schools are built here instead of over there. It's not heaven, but it can make things better. Another elite, William Holmes Porter, articulated that a political solution to Negro problems is definitely valid. However, the black masses saw this as that the power structures were not too worried about the poor people, because if they were, they would have done something before now. What we have here are Julian Bond, who was in the political world, he was an elected official, uh, state senator and becomes congressman, and William Holmes Borders, who was a very prominent and influential minister, who was talking about democracy and the idea of buy-in within the Atlanta Black community. But the Black masses oftentimes felt that the power structure was just not worried about them. This speaks to this interracial class tension. In terms of schools and housing, from 1960 to 1967, Atlanta's public schools gained 25,000 Black students while losing 7,000 white students due to racism and white flight. White flight is the concept to where uh, once society was desegregating, white people moved further out and in the context of Atlanta, north of the city, to get away from Black folk. You had 25 previously all white schools that had shifted black. You had 10 high schools in Atlanta that were all black. You had two that were predominantly black. And you had one predominantly white high school, which was East Atlanta. $60 million were spent on school facilities in Atlanta from 1963 to 1968. Now, I want to give you some perspective on this. There was $219 spent per white student and $171 spent on per black student. So you can see the discrepancy in terms of education. Again, this goes back to caste and class. Now, what I'm saying to you all is that the black elite and black middle-class children who went to public school, schools were still being, they were still spending less money on them. However, this also trickles down to black uh, working class and poor communities. Between 1958, in 1968, you had 21,000 units for housing, which totaled 67,000 people, which were demolished for the building of the expressway construction and urban renewal. This is particular to the Model Cities project, which put the Interstate 75 and 85 through the middle of Auburn Avenue, the Black Thoroughfare, and displaced roughly 10,000 people. You also had 21,000 units that were bulldozed and you had 5,000 built. So you can already begin to see the attack on public housing, particularly that was embodied by uh, black low income, no income folks. As you can see with this map that was drawn in 1968, you, you, it becomes very clear that this is the black community and the invisible marker that separated the black community from the white community was North Avenue. However, I want to introduce you to Maynard Holbrook Jackson Jr. Maynard Holbrook Jackson Jr. was a fifth generation Georgian. And while he was born in Dallas, Texas, uh, to Maynard Holbrook Jackson Sr. and Irene Dobbs Jackson, John Wesley Dobbs's uh, oldest daughter, uh, both sides of his family were from Georgia. Uh, his paternal grandfather founded Wheat Street Baptist Church, which is one of the most influential churches in Atlanta. His maternal grandfather, John Wesley Dobbs, was the unofficial mayor of the Sweet Auburn District. Maynard Jackson was not wealthy, but he was from a very influential family. And so politically, he had real influence. And in 1968, after the assassination 
of the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and Robert F. Kennedy. Maynard Jackson decides that he is going to run for the U.S. Senate against Herman Talmadge. The Talmadge family were one of the, the, the most well-known and iconic um, Southern, white Southern white supremacist oligarchs uh, that you can find. While Maynard Jackson uh, lost that Senate race, he was able to carry Atlanta. But a part of the problem that Maynard Jackson dealt with was the fact that he did not go to the Atlanta Negro Voters League or the Kingmakers to seek their approval because Maynard Jackson stepped out there on his own and did not kiss the rings of the Black Kingmakers. It was a clear sign that there was a new movement afoot in terms of politics and Maynard Jackson would embody that. In 1969, Maynard Jackson runs to become the city's first vice mayor. At the time, that particular uh, elected official's position was ceremonial, but Maynard Jackson made it be more political. And of course, this sets the stage for him to run for mayor in 1973, where he becomes the city's first black mayor and any uh, black mayor of any major Southern city. This is a picture of Maynard Jackson on the day that he won. Uh, he brought so much promise. He brought the symbolism of black political empowerment and electoral politics. When Maynard Jackson is elected to the city's highest seat, Jackson and all of his influence becomes extremely prominent because the things that he would do for the community that made Atlanta one of the most inclusive cities in the nation. The first thing was Maynard Jackson's gold standard for affirmative action. When he got into office, 0.03% of uh, black city contractors were receiving city contracts. By the time he got out of office and with his, with, with his um, successor, that bumps up to 35% of all city contracts that went to minority contractors. And at this point in time, when we talk about diversity or inclusion, we're talking about black contractors, black and women contractors. Maynard Jackson, using that affirmative action standard, built the Atlanta airport, expanded MARTA, the Metro Atlanta Rapid Transit Authority, uh, which was useful for folks who needed to be able to get around the city but didn't have cars. He also created the neighborhood planning unit, which allowed for low income, no income folk and people who lived in the city to have a say so in how urban renewal and gentrification would take place. Um, and Maynard worked really hard in terms of um, quelling police brutality that was a major problem in the city. One of the things that Maynard Jackson pushed, pushed forward was that he would prosecute police officers who use deadly force if no one else would. Now, the thing about this with Maynard Jackson is he does attract a particular population to come to Atlanta, particularly a young, black, vibrant, upper and middle class, a highly educated group to come to Atlanta. And this was good for the city. But how this would play out a little bit later is this. The International Olympic Committee has awarded the 1996 Olympic Games to the city of Atlanta. There you have it. The announcement is in. Atlanta, Georgia will be the site of the 1996 Summer Olympics. What a tremendous moment going on right now at the Olympic uh, meeting there in Tokyo. And of course, here in Atlanta as well. There you can see Maynard, Maynard Jackson, uh, May, the former mayor, Andrew Young, uh, just thrilled. Billy Payne has to be in tears at this moment. What a tremendous moment. Now let's go quickly to underground Atlanta. So I'm showing you all this because this is a major 
feat in Atlanta's history. On September 18th, 1990, Atlanta wins the bid for the Olympic Games. This is 95 years to the day that Booker T. Washington gave the speech that would later be deemed as the Atlanta Compromise. But what it also, but, but what the Olympics did for Atlanta is it put Atlanta on the world stage. What would take place afterwards though, is really a demonstration on how caste works within the black community. Now, allow for me to introduce you to Peter Uberoff, who was a travel mogul, um, who, who and, and also worked with Major League Baseball, who had shepherded Los Angeles to become the host city for the 1984 Olympics. In 1978, when Los Angeles made the bid for the 1984 Olympics, its only competition was Tehran, Iran, who was an absolute, um, activist and uh, civil unrest on the world stage. I mean, this is around the time of the Iranian um, hostage crisis and all kinds of different things. So basically Los Angeles runs unopposed, but what happens in Los Angeles is that the process of getting the Olympics was privatized and they brought together 150 businesses that put forth the money and brought the Olympics to Los Angeles in 1984 without costing taxpayers any money. Of course, this is idealistic for cities that were interested in hosting the World Games. However, in 1987, when Andrew Young was mayor, we see something different that takes place. Now give me some time to, 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 to help express who Andrew Young is. Andrew Young becomes mayor of Atlanta from 1982 to 1990. He had cut his teeth as one of Dr. King's lieutenants. Uh, he had also been tapped and appointed to become the ambassador to the United Nations uh, under President Jimmy Carter, who was from Georgia. And uh, after leaving uh, the United Nations as UN ambassador, he comes back to Atlanta. And after Maynard Jackson's two terms were up as mayor, Andrew Young was pushed forward to to lead the city because he had done so much work with Dr. King. Well, what happens is the man on the right, Billy Payne, who's in the green jacket, approaches then Mayor Andrew Young. And he says, I believe Atlanta can host the Olympics. At first, Billy Payne believes that he is talking over Andrew Young's head. But what he doesn't know is that a young Andrew Young, growing up in New Orleans, had gone to the Orphan Theater on Galvez Street to see Jesse Owens outrun the Nazis in the 1936 Olympics. Outside of that theater, the Nazi party was hiring Hitler. And one of the things that Young's father taught him is he says, if you hate people like those people hate you, you you're just as sick as they are. And so one of the things is that it was Young's mission to really promote an aspect of the beloved community. He had become a minister, he had worked with Dr. King. He had become one of Dr. King's uh, most trusted allies. But what happens with this is Young does green light Billy Payne to push forth the Olympic movement. And what we see here is the creation of the Georgia Amateur Athletic Foundation, where the city of Atlanta hosted more than 40 amateur uh, athletic competitions, which was a prerequisite for a city that was going to bid for the games. You also see the creation of the crazy Atlanta Nine. And this particular group of folks were noted for hosting serious parties that would sway the International Olympic Committee. Now, while you see the crazy Atlanta Nine, you see that there is very little uh, conversation in terms of diversity. And the only person that is seen as someone of color, particularly within this group, is Andrew Young. Of course, the crazy Atlanta Nine are created after Young is mayor of the city. But what is particularly useful about understanding this is that the image of Atlanta was created as King's hometown. It had also hosted the Democratic National Convention and the city was standing out on the world stage but it did very little for the poor and working class black people who lived in the city. This is how caste plays out. I'd like to introduce you to civil rights activist, Dorothy Bolden. Dorothy Bolden 
um, was born in Madison, Georgia. She moved to Atlanta at a very early age. Uh, she was uh, she was a beloved friend of the Herndon family. She had eye problems as a child, and the Herndon family had paid for her optical surgeries so that she could see. Um, later on in life, Dorothy Bowden founds the National Domestic Workers Union, which worked for uniform policies for domestic workers, particularly Black domestic workers around the city. She was also an advocate for nine-month education, all-day education uh, for Black children. She was an advocate for housing. She believed in the least of these. She believed in the beloved community. And it is said that whenever she would see mayors, um, city council people, presidents and whatever, whatnot, they would go running because Ms. Bowden did not play any games, but she championed and articulated the ideas of the black community. I'm about to show you a clip and I'm gonna let Ms. Bowden's words speak for themselves. Um, this particular clip that I'm about to show you actually comes out of the Auburn Avenue Research Library. This is a piece of archival information that I was found. And this, this took place around in the early 1990s to where Mrs. Bowden was asked what she felt about the Olympic Games. Now, what Ms. Bowden is about to articulate here is a real conversation around caste and class. Ms. Bowden articulates a counter narrative of Atlanta and all of its black mecha status in this particular conversation. And I want you to pay attention to how she is particularly critical of Atlanta's black polit uh, political figures. What were some of the issues that were um, you were fighting against um, in today? Uh -huh. I'm fighting issues like imposing on people's as referendum. Mm -hmm. I knew it wasn't going anywhere. I told them that it wasn't going anywhere. So what what do you think is bad about the bond referendum? Well, they knew all that was there before they being thought about doing that. This is part of the money going to go to Olympi because, see, you knew when you went and got Olympi, you all were finance able. Your city wasn't in the condition to accept it. You got the narrow streets that any city had. And a state. You know that. And all that big blowing that Maynard Jackson said, thanking God, he better go back and search again and wonder did he thank the devil? Because trouble been in this thing ever since it's been coming this way. Mm -hmm. And you ain't seen the trouble yet. This God gonna rain down rains down on them. Because see, they're always plotting. They're plotting how they can get money. It's to put it over there and there. Now it's going to take that much money to fix those bridges, but it's not going to take but a week to do it. That's stupid. Shouldn't take that much money. You had money before to fix it. You knew what was there. Everybody can come through this city and not pay a tax on anything and move on out somewhere else. Okay? Work in here, bring the buses in here, and they don't pay them. But you're going to ride the poor man to death to pay this. And they're going to put a substance tax right here for the city of Atlanta and nowhere else. Are you kidding me? You got to be sick. <laughs> and you got more poor folks here? And who in the hell do you think going to take that in that land there? Nobody going to take that stuff laying down. And I should have gotten one because I, I was praying for God to make me better. So I'm much better. Mm -hmm. And I was finna roll up my sleeve. Baby, me and you going to have a boxing match out here on this thing. Because I wasn't nowhere in the world. I was gonna, And tearing up all the communities going to make them what you want them to be? We not have any input? They ain't gone. So you can see the articulation here as to how Ms. Bowden, representing the ideas of the Black masses, representing those that are not a part of the casted and classed out system of Black Atlanta. Uh, she's articulating how on one side of, uh, of, of Black Atlanta, they see the Olympics as progress. They see Atlanta as a progressive city, but there is a whole group of, there's a mass of folk that don't see it in that particular light. 
as always, I am humbled and grateful to, to do any presentation or collaborate with the Auburn Avenue Research Library on African American history and culture. And also I wanna give a special thanks to the Atlanta Fulton Library System and the Atlanta Fulton Library Foundation. I'm always grateful and honored to collaborate with you. As you can see, Isabel Wilkerson's book on caste does discuss serious conversations around what divides us. But what it does not necessarily get after is how intra-racial class tensions will play out. The purpose of this presentation was to take Isabel Wilkerson's conversations around caste and to apply it to Atlanta to demonstrate how Atlanta's Black experience is of unique importance and deliberation. Thank you so much.